We've already seen that in a Bayesian framework, our posterior beliefs, what we think about the parameters, values before an experiment, influences what we think after, that the posterior was a product of the prior and the likelihood of the evidence. So this gives us some ability to kind of make our lives easier. If we, if we make a certain assumption about the prior, will it make our calculation or our work with the posterior easier? Now, obviously, we shouldn't set up a model which is blatantly wrong just because it's easier or nicer for us. But if there are similar distributions that can capture our beliefs and our uncertainties almost equally well, we may as well make our lives easy en route to the conclusions. So if we come back to the coin flipping example, where we've got a coin that lands heads with probability theta on each flip, independently for some unknown theta. The likelihood of my sample of heads and tails, or zeros and ones, if I convert them that way, will be something of this form of theta to the k times one minus theta to the n minus k. If I flip the coin n times and I get k heads and n minus k tails, my likelihood will look like that. So is there a distribution that I could choose for the posterior, which adequately describes or could adequately describe my belief about what theta's value is before I start, which will play nicely with that and give me a nice posterior distribution to work with. Now, again, rather than doing the example I did in the previous video of picking a normal distribution to characterize my belief about theta, I said at the time that wasn't a very good distribution because technically it did give some credence or credibility to negative probabilities. So ideally, I'd pick a distribution who could only describe values between zero and one because probabilities are only between zero and one. So if we recall the beta density that depended on two positive parameters, alpha and beta, and it had it was proportional to y to the alpha minus one, one minus y to the beta minus one. Now the bit at the front is basically um well it's a product and a ratio with um, gamma functions. And the gamma function we can think of as just the extension of the factorial function. So if alpha and beta are both integers, then I do have factorials at the front. Otherwise, I have this, I suppose, interpolation between factorial values. The expectation, I can calculate this straight away just by the expectation is the integral of y times the density function. So if I pull the normalizing constant of gamma alpha plus beta divided by gamma alpha gamma beta um, out the front, then all I've done, I'm left with y times the density function is going to be another beta distribution's density function, except the alpha minus one term is now an alpha. So I've sort of upped alpha by one. So by comparison, I can figure out that the integral of that must be gamma of alpha plus one, gamma beta, gamma alpha plus one, plus beta in the denominator. And because these behave like factorials, I can simplify this a little bit. I can first cancel gamma beta over gamma beta, but I can also cancel gamma of al alpha plus one over gamma of alpha. And similarly, the back term, we get alpha over alpha plus beta. So I've got two parameters to control where the mean is. But this is a great distribution to use for describing things like Bernoulli trials, so yes or no's. And this also therefore means it can be useful for things like a binomial distribution as well, where I have a large number 
of these Bernoulli trials. And the reason for this is that if I start with a prior distribution, which is proportional to my parameter theta to the alpha minus one, one minus theta to the beta minus one, when I multiply that by the likelihood for some observations, you can easily see that theta to the k times theta to the alpha minus one simplifies nicely. One minus theta to the n minus k times one minus theta to the beta minus one simplifies nicely. What we can say, and I've dropped the constant here, I'm only caring about proportionality, but a beta distribution was just theta to the sum number minus one times one minus theta to the sum number minus one, normalized and normalized by these gamma functions. So I've got a posterior which is of that same shape, the same type, albeit with updated parameters. Rather than the power of theta being alpha minus one, it's k plus alpha minus one. And similarly, the back term, rather than being a beta minus one, it's n minus k plus beta minus one. What this does tell me is that my posterior, what I now think about theta in light of the new set of observations x can be described by a beta distribution just updating the alpha to alpha plus k and updating the beta to beta plus n minus k so this gives me the expectation we said was the first parameter divided by the sum of the parameters and i can actually see what's happening here quite nicely well trivially if n is zero and i have no new observations k must also be zero. So if I have no new observations, then my posterior is my prior and nothing's changed. But you can see that as n and k get really, really big, if k is much bigger than alpha and n is much bigger than alpha plus beta, eventually this will just tend to k over n, which is the proportion of heads I got in my sample. So it starts with what I believed the expectation would be for my prior and it ends for very large samples with what the data set is telling me k over n and in between those extremes it kind of slowly blends the two i've got this nice ability to blend the prior with the evidence how much should i blend them well it depends on how strongly i believe that prior was it a guess or was it belief built on a heck of a lot of prior experiments? Because even if I wanted to say, I think this coin is about fair, I think my prior expectation is about a half. There's a lot of values I can pick for alpha and beta, such that alpha over alpha plus beta is a half. If alpha and beta are equal, but very small, I still think it's a half, but it won't take much of a, it won't take a very large sample to convince me otherwise. If I set alpha and beta to be equal and massive, then it'll take me a lot more evidence to change my mind. And this actually defines what we call a conjugate prior. And a conjugate prior is just one that, for a given likelihood function, for a given type of experiment, the posterior distribution will be the same type of distribution, although usually with updated parameters. So like in this case, I started with a beta distribution as my prior. I had a whole load of Bernoulli trials and I ended with a beta distribution described my posterior beliefs. So a beta with a beta means that the original prior was in fact a conjugate prior. And there's many other examples. Some of these are easy to prove, some of them are not. But for example, if I've got a normal distribution, let's say I know the variance sigma squared, but I don't know the mean mu, I describe that with a, um, another normal with mean m and variance s squared. I'll leave this as an exercise, but I can show that my posterior 
belief about theta will, um, sorry, my posterior belief about mu will still be a normal, albeit with this pretty messy update to the parameters.